Finally, I'd like to introduce the Reverend John A. Zahm, Associate Teaching Professor of Neuroscience, the Founding Director of Undergraduate Studies in Neuroscience and Behavior, and the person who has built this program from the ground up to be what it is today. Please welcome Dr. Nancy Michael. Most of those things aren't true. Okay. <sighs> just to get it out there, I always cry no matter how many times I practice. So just be okay with that. Okay. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. At the beginning of this school year, a friend started a meeting with this verse, and I think it's the perfect way to frame our final moments together. And no, Kimberly and I made a promise not to read each other's speeches. <laughs> so, uh, much of the two of the last, year, last two years has been clouded by darkness, but graduates, you are the light that the darkness could not overcome. There were many days that we all felt the darkness, but in those moments, your light kept each other going. You offered your light freely to those in need, received light from others ensure, to ensure that their light would not go out and yours would go on. You have also been a constant light in my life. Year after year, you give me so much strength and hope and courage, and it is so good to be able to gather together again. So let's all take a moment to rejoice in our ability to gather into commun in community to become united in our love and honor for these young graduates. This last little bit has been, become fondly known as the last class over the last few years. So, in preparation for this last class, I asked many of you to, I watched you guys, asked you guys to watch the movie Riot and the Last Dragon and family, this crazy request might have come to you as well. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, here is the premise. In ancient times, the kingdom of Kumandra <laughs> was united, living in harmony with, with all creatures, dragons magical creatures who brought rain, water, and above all, peace. That is, until the Droon came, a mindless plague born of human discord, waiting for a moment of weakness to spread like wildfire, turning everything it touched into stone. Kumandra fell into ruin. When all seemed lost, the dragons made their ultimate sacrifice. Harnessing the power of their combined magic into a single powerful dragon gem, the dragons were able to banish the Druun and free all of the stone, previously stoned people of Kumandra. But in doing so, the dragons themselves were lost to stone and eventually to legend. As Raya tells us, in this moment that could have been celebrated for the reunion and return of humanity instead became a battle for the remnant of the last bit of dragon, dragon magic, the dragon gem. Borders were drawn, creating five fractured kingdoms, once united, now enemies from within. Now, I'd like to take us all to take a step back from Raya and just imagine our humanity. And I'd like to make an additional ask that we consider the word humanity as defined both by the human race, as well as humanity defined by humanness and benevolence. What happens to humanity in a fractured world where groups of people who have, have had little or no direct contact for years, separated by time and old wounds? It's only expected that a land born of fractured, painful beginnings would eventually lose the experiences of what actually happened. And over time, those fractures can take on a life of their own. They become embedded in heritage, cultural pride, and individual identity. And indeed, this is what we see in the lives and hearts and minds of the people of Kumandra. Distrust, fear, and resentment all over who possesses the dragon gem. The real story begins with a conversation between Chief Benja and his daughter, Raya, where Chief Benja is trying to explain to Raya why he's invited their enemies to share a meal. If we don't stop and learn to trust one another again, it's only a matter of time before we tear each other apart. This isn't the world I want you to live in. This isn't the world I want you to live in. 
How many people have heard of oxytocin? Yeah? Okay, I got some hands. It's really hard to see under these lights, so I'm squinting. All right, so we've heard a lot. So in pop culture world, it's called the cuddle hormone or the love hormone. All right, oxytocin is actually a very old and very powerful brain chemical. Out of 172 billion cells, approximately, that make up the adult human brain, only about 25,000 of them are capable of producing and releasing oxytocin a small and yet remarkably powerful group of cells that live deep down in a part of our brain called the hypothalamus. The healthy function of oxytocin cells is absolutely essential to our human ability to attach to one another. So while many pop culture translations are egregiously incorrect, I'm okay with this one. The function of these oxytocin cells are indeed foundational in constructing our attachment to others and constructing our humanity, the foundations of our humanness. In our earliest stages of life, we are completely dependent upon others for care. And the patterns of care we receive when we are younger provide the environmental stimuli that helps our developing brains and our oxytocin circuits wire up what becomes the foundations for our older brains to build upon. For the first decade or so of life, we would never ever be able to say it words, but our neurobiology, our oxytocin cells, understand that our survival is totally dependent upon the bigger people around us. Embedded in our neurobiology is an expectation of care from the humans around us. And the absence of that care becomes the most potent activator of our stress biology, because without care and acceptance from others, we would not survive childhood. As such, our young brains are not only sculpted by patterns of care, but also patterns of culture. And Raya's brain is no different. Her entire lifetime, all she's learned is the cultural heritage of heart. It's clear that there is great pride and tradition instilled across her neural architecture, with particular honor associated with becoming a guardian of the dragon gem. It's also clear that upon learning that her father has invited their enemies from the other kingdoms, She's learned plenty about them, too. She doesn't want them in her kingdom. But if we don't stop and learn to trust one another again, it is only a matter of time before we tear each other apart. This isn't the world I want you to live in. In this moment, Raya's Ba, her dad, fights for the light of his daughter. And shortly after choosing to lean into her Ba's light, Raya loses her kingdom and her Ba in a moment of betrayal. With the Druun about to consume them both, her Ba does what any parent would do and gives his life to save his child. But he does another exceptionally courageous thing in this moment. Despite the betrayal, he charges his daughter to take on the responsibility to be the light of Kumandra. Don't give up on them. I love you. And with that, Raya's Ba is lost to stone. Chief Benja was the light in Kumandra's darkness, and in this moment, he passes the responsibility of the light to his daughter. But recognizing that there should be light and accepting responsibility to be the light are two very different things. Doubting our ability is normal, and it's also normal to dismiss our responsibility because after all, what can just one person do? At many points along her journey, you hear Raya say that the world is broken, so people don't trust each other. Growing up on this narrative, no one in Kumandra needs to accept responsibility for the way that things are. And everyone in Kumandra can have the ability to relinquish their responsibility to be the change they might hope to see. There is no doubt that being people is hard. But do you ever think that the world might be broken because people don't trust each other? When we don't have experience with something, there's no hole in our brain letting us know what we don't know. So unfortunately, when we read a headline or internet post, tiny pieces of information that may or may not be true get incorporated into our neural network. Our brains are obligated to use those tiny pieces to weight all of our neural calculations about that thing that we have very little experience with. And this is indeed what happens in the, in the kingdoms of Kumandra. For 500 years, heart, talon, fang, spine, and tail 
have been separated. No individual living in those kingdoms has any real experience with any other living person from any other kingdom. But rest assured, because they're human, they all have a lot of spiels about the other people, right? Given this deep-seated history and Raya's limited yet very painful experience, it's easy to understand Raya would doubt her Ba's belief that they could ever become Kumandra again. She's lost her Ba, she's lost her home, always preparing for the Druun's attack. How can Kumandra come back from such a place? I recently attended an incredible community fundraiser at which the organization's founder quoted Romans 12. A number of people in the audience expressed signs of approval, like clapping and amens and mm -hmm's. However, not being particularly religious and certainly not a biblical scholar, I was kind of lost. Until luckily for me, the next thing on the agenda was to read some verses from Romans 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another beyond yourselves. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if possible, and as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Love and attachment are requirements throughout our lifetimes. Not only the biological expectation to receive love, but it is also the biological expectation to express love to others. While well, oxytocin might very well be the cuddle hormone, and early caregiving plays a remarkable role in sculpting our oxytocin network, one giant mistake in pop culture narratives is that of independence. Our oxytocin network doesn't actually disappear as the cultural narrative of adult independence and self-sufficiency might suggest. With oxytocin as a neurobiological constant throughout our lifetime, we need each other just as much as grown-ups as we do when we're kids. Sure, our responsibilities and roles shift, but our brain's expectation of healthy oxytocin function persists throughout our lifetime and requires deep social connectedness that happens in real life. And when our brains don't get that social stimuli that it needs to drive healthy oxytocin function, we actually feel its loss. All we have to do to get a sense of this feeling is to look back on the last two years. Sadness, loneliness, isolation. No matter how old we get, we are never independent. Healthy oxytocin function requires deep interdependence throughout our lifetime. From our interdependence grows our humanity and offers a universal neurobiological foundation of solidarity. Violations of our obligate independence is also why actions like betrayal can hurt so badly. And without repair, hurt people tend to hurt people, and we perpetuate harm. When Namari betrays Raya, the dragon gem is broken and the Druun are released, feeding on human discord, consuming everything in their path until interdependence is restored. When preparing the meal for the kingdom's gathering, Chief Benja turns to Raya and states that we have a choice. We can tear each other apart or choose to come together again and build a better world. It's not too late. Seven and a half billion different brains on the planet. Seven and a half billion different life experiences that create a remarkable diversity of neural architecture through which we are obligated to see our world. It doesn't make us enemies. It simply makes us human. And as humans, we all have to take responsibility for humanity. We all take responsibility for humanness. As we watch the film, we realize it's not Chief Benja's light that's ultimately able to heal their fractured kingdom, but the light and hope and courage of his child. Just as Chief Benja passed the responsibility of being the light to Raya, 
As graduates of the University of Notre Dame, I now pass that responsibility to you. You are the light that the darkness cannot overcome. As graduates, you are now gifted the responsibility to take leadership in overcoming evil with good. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't give up on them. We love you. Don't give up. It can feel overwhelming. After all, what can just one person do? So, when you find yourselves questioning the power of one, think about oxytocin. What? It's a weird thing to say. Oxytocin cells make up less than one and a half of one millionth of a percent of the adult human brain. That's a zero with a decimal and a whole, whole lot of zeros before you get to any numbers. Yet, consider their influence over so much of who we are. Just like you are only one person, one oxytocin cell only has one axon. But that one axon has far-reaching impact and can modulate the function of thousands of other cells. Over the course of your life, you will continue to be just one person, but you have the opportunity to modulate the lives of thousands of others through our obligate interdependence. We can all take part in being the light. It is not until the very end, when all seems lost, that Raya realizes the gravity of her father's words. I believe we can be Kumandra again, but someone has to take the first step. Raya takes her piece of the dragon gem, places it in the hands of her enemy, Namari, steps into the darkness, and is overcome by the drune, and turns to stone. She puts her faith in Namari, her enemy. She puts her faith in that Romans 12 kind of love. Sisu is right. Being people is hard. We have small heads, no tails, we lie to get what we want, and we don't trust each other. After all, the world's broken, right? But maybe the world is broken because we don't trust each other. Taking the first step is hard, and much like Raya, we often have to take the first step before we feel ready. But from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. The book of Luke, Luke teaches us that it is our responsibility as those who have been, been given much to take the first step. And Caesar is also right. A little gift never hurts either. So, in our final moments, I'd like to visit the university's mission statement. The university prides itself on being an environment of teaching and learning that fosters the development in its students of those disciplined habits of mind, body, and spirit that characterize educated, skilled, and free human beings. In addition, the university seeks to cultivate in its students not only an appreciation for the great achievements of human beings, but also a disciplined sensibility to the poverty, injustice, and oppression that burden the lives of so many. The aim is to create a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good that will bear fruit as learning becomes service to justice. I will ask that you join with me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today to celebrate these incredible graduates and express deep gratitude to anyone else in their lives who has ever gifted them their light. Thank you for watching over them during their last four, sometimes rocky years here at Notre Dame. We ask that you continue to watch over them as they consider what their responsibility will be in using their education in service to justice. Help them be courageous in sharing their light. Remind them that they are the light that the darkness will not overcome. Help us all to embrace the depths of our interdependence to recognize the universal solidarity that binds human to human, that creates our humanity and our humanness. Sometimes we might feel the darkness, 
But in those moments, please remind us of this moment, a moment in which humans from five continents and dozens of family, languages, cultures, and backgrounds have gathered together, united in love, love and honor for these graduates before you. Help us remember that we all have the responsibility to take part in creating the world that we do want our children to live in. And we can do this by leaning into the light and leading with a Romans 12 kind of love. In your name we pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the class of 2022. The emptiness got a brand new plan for me like a silhouette. Our eyes are looking up, gonna get what we. Have.